with me if you would this morning, Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4 this morning. Uh, the other week I went into a store and I went through the line on purpose that had a cashier. I waited in a shorter line than I probably would have in the self-checkout, but I don't have very good luck with the self-checkout line. So I went through this line, I got up to the front, and I said to this, this, uh, this young lady, I said, how are you doing? Are you having a good day? And that's kind of my initial line. I've kind of began to intentionally do this, and she responded to me and said, well, actually, it's been a, a horrible day. It's been a bad week. It's been just a difficult thing. And then she began to describe her life. And this is the line that I continually hear from people. She said, you know, to be honest, I am just exhausted. I'm working two jobs. I'm running my kids everywhere. I just, I, I'm exhausted beyond measure. I just need a break. Now, the reality of it is, that's pretty much the common response from most people today, is it not? You hear that at, through cashiers and waiters and waitresses and co-workers and colleagues. There's this, this common mantra that says, man, I am just busy beyond measure. I am exhausted. I'm tired. I'm running from one thing to the next. By the way, even if you're retired here, you probably still are keeping busy. I hear that constantly. I'm just so busy. I'm just, I thought it was going to be time to stop, but I'm just so busy. The statistics make abundantly clear that we work and we are in the most workaholic culture in society. Uh, probably the definition of our lives would be that we are tired, we're exhausted, we're depleted, and that that alone, that cry has become a banner of where people find connection. I was at the ball field the other day and I was listening to a conversation between two parents. The one was describing how they just are so tired of running everywhere. They feel like they're constantly having to do something. And, and this other parent spoke up and said, you know what, I feel the same way. It's actually a connection point with people now. I'm busy. In fact, according, according to one Christian author, he said this, two of the top prescribed medications in America are Valium and Tagamet. The former is a muscle relaxant to help people deal with stress. The latter stops the flow of hydrochloric acid to ease a churning stomach plagued with ulcers. If pharmaceuticals are any barometer to where our culture is at emotionally, we're the most uptight, stressed out, and anxiety-ridden culture on the face of the earth. You think that's true? We're anxiety ridden we need a break we need a pause now the reality of it is we know this because we say things like we need to stop and smell the roses but there doesn't seem to be enough time to rest i mean we try to use time almost like we do our budget right we try to get a little bit here and a little bit there and we even stuff envelopes with what we view as quantity time over quality time well, I'm going to give better quantity or better quality while the quantity fades. And that has led to high blood pressure, heart attacks, broken relationships, sleep deprivation, poor eating habits, and so on and so forth down the line. And while we know what we ought to do and maybe even what we should do, the reality of it is we don't have time to squeeze in a break anywhere. And for some of us, if we're really being honest this morning, and let me be the first to say that this message is probably more for me than any of us because I am a workaholic in some ways. I think, eat, sleep, this place, and I try to, if I'm being really raw with you, I try to authenticate it and try to pass it on by saying, at least what I do matters, right? I say that to myself. Well, what I do really matters compared to some others, right? I mean, you probably go to your work and you think, does it really matter? You try to make it matter, but I can actually say this does matter. And yet I find myself many times constantly thinking about what I need to do next. And we think that a vacation is going to solve that or a day off is going to solve that. No, no, because you know what happens on vacation. You go and two days is unwinding, two days is actually enjoying it, and three days is preparing for what you have to catch up on when you get back. And so vacation doesn't really bring rest. It really doesn't bring a break. It's good. It doesn't solve that. There, there are some of us here this morning that would say, well, wait a minute here. I, man, I, I think rest seems like a waste of time. I said these lines before in, in kind of jest, but I actually kind of live them sometimes. I say, 
I'll rest when I'm dead. When they say rest in peace will be the moment I actually will rest. And, and, and we hear people say, well, I'm going to work for the weekend. I'm going to work for the weekend. Well, well then what, what does the weekend mean, right? Thank goodness it's Friday. What are we really saying is we're working for a moment where we're going to go out and maintain our yards, do the weekend projects, fulfill our honey-do list, travel, watch television, go to ball games, fulfill family obligations, and then try to have time for a hobby. There's too much to do and too little time. And we even get spiritual with it and we say, do you, don't you know that idleness is the devil's workshop? I had someone once say, you know the devil ne never takes a break. And I said, and that's our model? As the old saying goes, there's no rest for the wicked and the righteous don't need any. Now, you might be here this morning, you might say, well, wait a minute, Dave, there's a lot of people that are lazy out there. Let me tell you why they're lazy. They're lazy because there's a yearning in them for rest, and when they can't find it in doing, they end up giving up. So there are some that will turn to workaholism, while others will turn to laziness. At the core of our hunger, at the core of our hearts, at the same problem that we face, if we were to define the culture by being worried, hurried, and buried or buried, we are longing to find a deep down, soul satisfying, heart refreshing rest. In fact, Chuck Swindoll said this in one of his books. He said that we as Christians are more like a herd of cattle that is stampeding than we are a flock of sheep resting beside still waters. And the hamster wheel of life, it seems that rest actually eludes us. It's what we long for, but it's not what we find. It's what we want to go after, but it's not reality. And if we think just having an afternoon with our feet in a hammock or our bottoms in a hammock and our hands on a glass of Chick-fil-A sweet tea, does that bring rest? You know it ends. You know there's things that go through your mind. There are things that you begin to think about and never bring you rest. So the, the question I want to ask this morning is what is true rest? What does it mean to pause our lives, to pause the treadmill of our life and to find rest in Christ? What does the Bible talk about and reference about this yearning and struggle that we have for rest. What is it? What does it look like? What is the rhythm that God has envisioned for our lives? So we're gonna look in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter four. Now, as you are there, let me, let me say this. We have done a series uh, about four and a half years ago, almost five years ago actually, um, on the, through the book of Hebrews. And so we did a whole series through this book. We know many of you maybe weren't here for that, but we went through a whole series through the book of Hebrews. If you were, this is still going to be uh, uh, rejuvenated to us because I believe as we go through the text, it's, it's beautiful. It's awesome. It's amazing to go back through something we've read before, and I've seen it in a new light even this week. Here in Hebrews, let me explain what's happening. Hebrews is written, obviously, to a group of Hebrews. We don't know who the author is. Some believe it's Paul. I don't believe. I believe it's a close associate with Paul. Some believe maybe Barnabas or maybe even someone else. But, but he, he goes back and, and he's writing to the Hebrews who are scattered abroad, based out of Jerusalem, but scattered abroad. Many of them, for the first time, are facing persecution. They're facing difficulty. And so the author is writing to encourage them. And if you were to pick a theme of the book of Hebrews... If you were to pick a theme of the book of Hebrews, the theme would be called Jesus is better. From the very beginning, the author of Hebrews is writing to describe the fact that Jesus is worthy of even suffering, worthy of everything in life. He is better. In chapter one, it's Jesus is better than all the angels. Jesus is better than any created beings. Jesus is better. We come to chapter two, where he begins to talk about how Jesus is the founder of salvation, the forerunner of our salvation, that Jesus is better than anything offered on earth. We get to chapter three. In fact, we see, let's take a look at chapter three just to set the tone. It says, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, 
as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. He says here, and his third point throughout Hebrews is that Jesus is better than even Moses. Now remember, he's talking to Hebrews. So to hear that would be like, all right, all right. So Jesus is better than even our, one of our fathers, Abraham and Moses, right? Jesus is better than Moses. And then he begins to describe why Jesus is better than Moses. And his point is that Moses didn't bring them to what they really needed. We come to chapter four, and this is where we're gonna spend our time this morning, chapter four, because the question then began for them as they were being persecuted is, is if, if the Old Testament describes rest, none of us are getting rest, we're getting persecuted. So what they began to do is question whether rest really existed, and they began to think that this was some cruel illusion by God, that God dangled rest in front of them and said, nope, 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 And they were thinking, wait, I thought there was supposed to be rest when we come to you. I thought there was supposed to be rest when we know you. And so it was some cruel illusion. And the writer of Hebrews is going to address that in this chapter, chapter four. He mentions it in chapter three. Now he comes to chapter four and he says, let's read together in verse one. Therefore, while the promise of entering the rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listen. For we who believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. He comes to this and he says, there is rest that is still available. Now, let's stop here for a moment. Let's pause here. So he says, therefore, there is a rest that still remains for us. There is a rest that is still available. And notice he says in this text that it comes through faith. There is a rest that we should be able to receive by faith. And we're going to come back to that in a few moments. What's interesting, throughout the scriptures, you find two words, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, that really defines for us rest. In the Old Testament, the word we find is the word Shabbat. Um, The word is where we get our word Sabbath the word rest. In the New Testament, the word here in Greek is the word katapausis. I wanna show you this, it's kind of interesting. Do you notice a second part of that compound word katapausis? It looks like pause, right? Because this is where we get our word pause from. It means to stop, to cease, or to find a resting place. This word is where we get our word pause. In this text, it's literally katapausin. We ought to be pausing. (laughs) That's the Greek word. We ought to take a stop, we ought to rest, we ought to cease from work, and we ought to pause and contemplate these things. Now, the question is, because he introduced this, he says rest comes through faith. There is still a rest available for us. The question is, what is it? If we're all yearning for rest, for a pause in life, for a real vacation, what is it? What is this rest? What is it that we yearn for deep in our souls? Well, he's gonna begin and he's gonna give four points of history to define for us what it's not or to introduce it to us. And we're gonna go through these rather quickly. Take a look at what he says. In chapter four, and we see the end of verse three, he says, for we who believe enter that rest. We're gonna come back to that in a moment. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse four, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. So he gives his first point of history. He says, hey, do you remember creation? God creates, and on the seventh day he rests. So our first picture of history is creation. God rested on the seventh day. Now, just a little side note here I want to bring up. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a geologist. I I believe that the scripture, as uh, if I can say a theologian, and I wouldn't call myself a theologian, but loving theology and Bible. I guess we're all theologians in many sense. Um, I believe the Bible seems to indicate pretty clearly, although we live in a world where people will say, well, the days of creation aren't literal days. There are periods of time. There are a couple wrenches theologically that, that, that cause a slip up with that. Now, I know scientists may come from a different view, but let me say from a theological view, here's the picture. When God creates each day, It always ends with, and there was sunrise and sunset, and that was the first day, and that was the second day, and that was the third day. So the text itself, written by Moses through the Holy Spirit, seems to tie itself to a 24-hour period. 
It's one of the reasons why I believe that it was literally six days. Now, I know scientists might say it's something different today, but they have a theological problem with the text. And we've got to figure that out, and that's another conversation for another time. But I believe another proof of that is not only the literal word for day in Hebrew is yom, and it represents a 24-hour period. It can be periods of time, but in that text, it is centered on day and night, is this other point of creation. The fact that Jesus rests, or God rests in creation, Jesus, of course, was involved in creation, rest on the seventh day. If it's a period of time of a million years, sign me up for that rest. I, I think it's a literal day, and the point is he sets aside a sunrise, sundown, sun and night, moon and night, or, or night, night and day, light and darkness, and he says that's a day that is set aside to rest. God rested, and let's, let that rock our minds for a moment. God rested, how strange is that? Genesis chapter two, it tells us this. It says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all of his work that he had done in creation. God rested. Now, the question is, why did God rest? Do you think it's because God was so overwhelmed over the six-day period when he spoke creation into existence that he said, man, that almost did me in. I'm ordering myself a Chick-fil-A sweet tea. Man, that creation almost did me in. I am going to lay myself down in the heavenly hammock. I mean, we're talking about a God that doesn't sleep or slumber, a God that is all-powerful and ever-present, taking a day off. One of the questions that runs through my mind is, what did he do on the day off? Did he go into the heavenly kitchen and bake some cookies? Did he go out to the earth that he had just created and say, I'm gonna do a little gardening and form the Rockies then? No, because that would be creating, right? What did he do on the sixth day? Well, we're not told, but what we see is this has become a pattern for us, that God laid out for us a description, a God that doesn't need sleep, doesn't need rest, says, you know what, I'm gonna show you the importance of rest, that in the perfect world I created, and by the way, every time he created, finished a day, he always says, it is good. It is good. He reflected on what he created, and then he rested on the seventh day. So their first point of, of historical reference is that this is, not, this is not a man-made idea. This is a God-given idea. By the way, when someone talks about the Sabbath, I find it very interesting that the word Sabbath doesn't show up for the first time in the law. The Sabbath shows up for the first time in Genesis chapter two. It is the word Shabbat. It's the word Sabbath. So it's not all about the law. It's about God. God gave a pattern of rest. He demonstrated it to us. Notice we go on, verse five, the second example of history. He says, and again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Now let's stop right there. So we get to verse, f- verse five, or I'm sorry, verse six, five and six, and he says, hey, here's another example. And he goes back to what he said previously in chapter four, verses one through three, as well as in chapter three. He brings up again the people of Israel in the wilderness. He says, hey, you remember Moses? Moses led the people out of Egypt. And what was the demand that Moses made or the command that Moses gave to the people of Israel as they came out of Egypt? He said, you know what? You're gonna be God's people and he's gonna give you a land, a land that's flowing milk and honey. Let's go to that land where there'll be rest. They were slaves. Remember that in Egypt? Moses comes and says, God is promising rest. God is promising deliverance. God is promising deliverance from bondage. And what ended up happening? They come out of Egypt and they land themselves in the wilderness. Now, remember, the wilderness journeys were, journeys were 11 days. It took 11 days to go from Egypt to the promised land. It took them 40 years. Why? Because of disobedience. What happened? They did not believe in the rest that God offered. Remember, they stood on the brink of the Jordan River looking into the promised land and still didn't believe that God was going to deliver them. While in the wilderness, do you remember what God gives them? God gives them in Exodus chapter 20 a day. Notice the text here says, they shall not enter my rest since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. 
They were given a day. In the law, Exodus chapter 20, the fourth commandment is, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. What happened? It didn't satisfy them. It didn't fulfill them. It didn't cause them to greater obedience. In fact, they fell short of it. They didn't grasp what that day meant. So even in Exodus 20, they are in the wilderness. They don't obey what God told them to obey. They don't follow what God tells them to follow. They didn't find the rest that they thought they were going to find. So Moses and Israel, here's again a picture being painted, a canvas for us of what God desires in rest. Notice what this says next. Take a look at the third example that we see in the text. Begin in verse seven. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He brings up chapter three again, where he quotes a Psalm of David. And David says in this psalm that God brings rest. And he says, but don't harden your heart as in the days of rebellion, as in the days of the wilderness wanderings. He brings up David. Now, this is interesting. Notice he's bringing up these points of history. Creation, Moses and Israel in the wilderness, and now David. Now, David was one of the father of the Jews as well. He was a great king, right? He was a king of whom the Messiah was going to come from. But you know what's interesting about David, and I think it's pretty telling in this example that he gives, is that David, in many of his psalms, mentions that he still needed rest. We're talking about David. David was not only the king of the Jewish people, not only the king of Israel, David was probably the one who had the most peace in the kingdom of any king in Israel's history. David was the one that conquered many of the lands, who defied the enemies, who overwhelmed them and found peace in the land. If you remember, uh, David also is considered to be the architect of the city of Jerusalem, which by the way, anybody who know what the city of Jerusalem means? Heru Shalom means the city of peace. David was a man who had peace in the kingdom. There was a great land, there was a great peace. It was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. David, the architect of the temple, David, the architect of the city of Jerusalem. By the way, remember David was the one that laid out the plans for the temple. It was Solomon, his son, that God said is going to build it. David was the architect of the city, but the architect did not find rest in his architecture. The architect of the city did not find, did not find rest in the city of peace. He didn't find rest in the future temple. He didn't find rest. Why? It wasn't meant to be Rest the way we are looking for. It was meant to be a picture. Notice here we have David. Notice we go on. Here's another example. Verse eight. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So the last example he gives, he brings up Joshua. Remember Joshua was the one that took the people of Israel and led them into the promised land. Joshua was one of the two spies who came back and said, we can take the land, let's go. Remember they said, no, 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 we can't do it. They're, 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 too, they're too, too mighty for us. We can't take the land. And it was years later, Joshua and Caleb, the only two men who came out of Egypt that goes into the promised land. And when they get in the promised land, do you remember the reaction of the people of Israel? Literally, well, not quite literally, but somewhat literally, they said, this is it? I mean, it was a land that was fertile. It was flowing with milk and honey, but they had to work it. They had to build cities they had to conquer enemies. Remember Joshua? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, right? And the walls came. You know that song, right? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. The walls came tumbling down. They had to work. They had to work. They had to work. And they were tired. And they said, this is the promised land. This is the land of peace. This is the land of rest. There is no rest. We got to build. We got to do. We got to accomplish. In building, they didn't find rest. They didn't find rest. Now, if we pause here, I hope that you see very quickly that this idea of rest is central to the Christian story of the scriptures. From creation to the law to the promised land, all the way through we see this idea of rest. This idea of rest. Joshua coming to the land, Moses in the wilderness, David with a city of peace. There's this idea of rest. However, God is reminding us not to worship the picture. These are all meant to be for us a shadow. 
a shadow. In fact, there's, 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 this is a shadow that something else is casting upon it. I love what Paul writes in Colossians. It says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon, or a Sabbath. There's our word. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. There's something deeper that God resting on the seventh day meant to point us to. There is something deeper that the law given to Moses in the wilderness to the people of Israel was meant to point us to. There was something deeper that the city of peace, this restful city by David was meant to point us to. There was something deeper that Joshua in conquering the land it was meant to point us to, this land that was supposed to be the land of rest. There was something deeper. It, these things are all shadows. And you know what? We as people are very quick to worship and celebrate shadows. In fact, a, a little bit later on the service, we are going to partake of a shadow. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper, which is a shadow of what Jesus did on the cross through his death and resurrection. He died. His blood was shed. We're going to partake of a shadow. Now, no one walked in here today and probably walked in taking a look at their shadow on the way in going, that's a pretty good shadow. That's pretty good. I like that. You didn't look at somebody's shadow and go, man, that's a pretty good shadow, man. Your shadow's looking good today. No one does that. Now kids, think about kids for a moment. What do we do? The kids, they see their shadow and they start going, I, okay, let's not kid around. I do this still too. The shadow's on the wall and I'll make these, right? This is what we do. We see the shadows, we make the little puppets, we do funny things. But we don't worship the shadow. We know the shadow just follows along with the, the, the substance that is making it. Now, the question is then, as we read this text, as we follow through this, what is it? Well, take a look at verse nine. He again gives us a picture. It says, so then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So he says to us, God's rest is still available. God's rest is still available and there is rest for our soul. It is still available to us. It is here and now. God's rest is available. Just as much as God rested on the seventh day from his works so can we. Now the question we ask is what is that rest? Well the substance, what we're actually looking for, what our yearning, what our longing, what our deep soul cry is, is for something that's going to satisfy. Here's the question. What was it about God that caused him to rest? What did he do? Every time he rested, when he rested on the seventh day, it wasn't because he needed to. It wasn't because he was overwhelmed. It was because he stood back and he looked at his creation and he said, this is very good. You know what God was? God was satisfied. God was satisfied that his creation was enough. So what we're looking for is something to satisfy, is something to fulfill that longing, that deep soul hunger for rest. What is it? When we come to the New Testament, we don't have time to look at every verse, but when we come to the New Testament, what he's talking about is Jesus. Jesus is our rest. Now I know some of you might be here this morning, you might say, Dave, that's it? That's what you're gonna give us. You're gonna talk about our busy lives and pausing, and then you're gonna tell us that Jesus is the rest. It's kinda like the kid that comes home from church and you say, what did you learn about today? And he says, God. So, so there's no points as to how we, right, how do we get rest or how we should look and view rest. No, no, you can't have rest without Jesus, folks. You will not have rest if you don't get that rest, deep-hearted longing, your soul-searching hunger is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus said this on multiple occasions, Luke chapter six. He said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Notice he doesn't say there's not a Sabbath. He says that he is what the Sabbath is about. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He, he doesn't say I came to fulfill the Sabbath or overcome the Sabbath. He says, look, look at me, I'm the Sabbath. I'm what it's about, I'm what it's all about. This is what the pause button is for. 
He said in Matthew 11, this well-known text that we all probably know, it says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for my souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, here, you're looking for rest for your soul. I'm it. I'm the rest you're looking for. I'm, I'm, I'm the rest that you're longing for. I'm the only one that can satisfy. I love this picture. He says, in creation, there's a physical picture of rest. Stopping. In the Sabbath day, there's a physical picture of rest. In the promised land, there's a physical picture of rest. It's a canvas. God is painting this physical picture of something deeper spiritually. He says, but in Jesus, in redemption, there is actual spiritual rest. There's actual rest in him. There is no soul rest. There is no heart rest. There is no true rest apart from Christ. Now, I want us to see how he applies this. If the New Testament tells us, and Jesus said himself, I'm the rest, how does this look applied? What does this look like to be applied? And it says here that God's stopped his works, and we ought to do the same. I want to go back because this text, centered on this idea of rest, is surrounded with these phrases, let us. In fact, there are three of them. We're only, only going to look at two this morning, where there is a response to the truth of this text, where it says, let us do this, let us do that. Let's go back to chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. It says this, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, here it is, the first one, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as it was to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith. For we who have believed enter that rest. So our first let us, our first point is let us fear and respond by faith. Now, before we go any further, I, I need to clarify some things that we just pointed out because there's some big deal at stake here. And some of you, you're, you're, you're pretty sharp, and so you're gonna think here, you're gonna read this, and you're gonna be like, wait a minute, Dave. You're telling me that the ideal Christian life is living a life of fear? You're telling me that the way God wants us to live our lives, what Jesus wants ideally for us is to perpetually be afraid and question whether we have rest or not. Well, there's a couple things that are a problem with that. First of all is our definition of fear. When we think of fear, we immediately think of being scared. Or as some say in West Virginia, a scared. We're, we're afraid, right? When we think of fear, we immediately think of being afraid. But the word also can mean reverent. Or where, where we give reverence and we give understanding and we give away. So here's an example of this. And, and this is a well-known example. It's, I mean, not a, not a difficult one. It's like when you have kids. I remember when we had kids and our kids were younger. We have kids. But when they were younger, when we had little kids, we would block off the end of our driveway if we were out in the driveway playing. And the reason we do that is because we were so afraid of them running into the street. And so we would sit out there and we would watch them like hawks. And we would say, if, if it was one time, we said it thousands of times. Don't go in the street. 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 Don't, if the ball goes, I'll get it. You don't go in the street. You're three years old, you're four years old. I don't want you to go in the street. Now listen, the kids have grown 15 years old. I'm not looking at my son saying, don't run in the street, David. Caleb, don't run in the street. I don't do that. I, I, they, they get this. They, they grasp this. But, but listen, so we are pouring into our kids in that moment fear, are we not? We're saying to them, we, you need to respect the street. You need to respect the road. Cars can come down and they can hit you. But what we're not wanting our kids to do is when they go to bed at night, lay in bed crying, getting up saying, Daddy, Mommy, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of the street. I'm afraid of the cars. I'm afraid the street's going to get me. I, I can't ride in the car ever again because I'm going to be on the street. We want fear, but we don't want them to be afraid. You see the difference? What we're trying to do is build a healthy respect of the road. That's the image here that, that we're getting from Hebrews. The point is not that we're, we're afraid, oh, am I in the rest, am I in the rest, am I in the rest, did I have rest, do I have it, God, do I have, that's not the point here. 
The point is that we have a reverence for God and the impact is his promise that our reverence for God leads us to respond by believing, trusting, faith in what he did as enough. A reverence for God that leads to faith in him. It's a healthy fear that he is calling us to. The people of God, they, they, didn't, they didn't have that. In fact, when they got toward the promised land, they didn't believe in the promise of God. And because they didn't fear God, they lived their own way and they didn't get in. And so he's calling us here to, that, that if you get who God is, yeah, you, you're, you're gonna have fear, a healthy fear that leads to faith. Now, I think this is pretty ironic here that he uses the word fear because, and this is a little side note for a moment. Isn't it true that we who are workaholics, the reason we're workaholics is because we're afraid? Isn't it true that the reason why we pour so much into the things that we do because we want to be accepted and we want to feel like we've accomplished? Isn't that why we work so hard? If you're here this morning and maybe you're not a hard worker, maybe you're kind of lazy. Isn't the reason that you're lazy is because you're afraid of work? You're afraid that it's not going to accomplish what you yearn and desire for. The whole point of this is you're fearing something today. The question is, are you going to fear the right thing? Or are you going to fear the wrong thing? So here he's giving this and saying, listen, the people of Israel, they were afraid that they weren't going to be getting in the land. They were so worried about getting in the land that they weren't willing to be obedient to God. And as a result, they didn't get in. But for you and I, he's saying, listen, is our fear turning us into faith. We get who God is. We understand that he holds our lives in his hands. We understand that rest is founded in him. And so now, I believe I trust him. I trust him. I believe in him. I believe his way. That's the whole point. Salvation by faith in Jesus alone. Listen to this. If you want to apply rest in your life, you're here this morning, you don't know Christ, you are never going to have soul rest. You're never going to have satisfying rest where your spirit is rested, your, your body is truly rested. You're never going to understand that if you don't give your life to Jesus Christ. Never going to get it. You might say, well, wait, when I die, right, somebody will say rest in peace. Not if you don't know Christ. That's a myth, the idea of rest and peace. You, you're not, never going to find rest. And, and what I find interesting, follow me, everything in life, earn it, deserve it, conquer it, accomplish it, accomplish it, and then God comes on the scene, Jesus comes to earth, he goes to the cross because we can't pay for sin, he dies on that cross, offers his body for us, sheds his innocent blood, three days later walks out of the grave to say, you don't have to conquer it. You don't have to appease me. You don't have to, you're not doing obedience so you can get right with God and get salvation. So this whole point of rest is it's no more trying to please God by our feeble fleshly works. At the moment you enter God's rest, the works cease to please God. It's not about pleasing God. Because our works without Christ don't please him anyway. Remember that verse in Isaiah? Our good deeds are like filthy rags. Every good that we do without Christ is selfishly motivated anyway. So they're not really gonna bring any more rest. They're not gonna appease him anyway because he can't be appeased. He, the only way he was appeased was by the, the blood of his perfect son. We can't do it. And so it means I have to stop my legalistic activity. And by the way, if you're here without Christ, you are legalistic. Some of you are like, what? If you're without Christ, you're trying to get your way somewhere. You're trying to attain your way somewhere. It could just be earthly. Isn't that a legalistic attempt? You are trying to appease someone. You're trying to bring favor somehow to your life. That's legalism. You're trying to get somewhere that you can never get. And Jesus came and says, listen, there is rest in me. My yoke is easy. It is a condition not of becoming, but of being. If you're here and you want true rest, it is founded in Jesus Christ. The world yells and screams, improve yourself, do better for yourself, earn more. It never happens. All the vacations in the world will not get it because there is no spiritual rest in them. It is only founded in Christ. Now, the question is, what do we do with that? So his first point is, let us fear so that we will respond by faith, verse three, for we who have believed enter that rest. 
So if I trust in the promise of God through Jesus, I've got rest. I've got rest. Now, turn over to verse 11. Here's our next let us, based upon verses nine and 10, where he says, hey, God rested from his works, and so do we. We rest from our works of salvation. Our second point here, he says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So our second point here, and our last point, is let's strive to enter that rest. Now this is meant to be funny, if you're reading this. So he says, first of all, by fear, let us respond by faith. We get who God is, now we respond by faith. The second point is, now let us strive to live in that rest. Now what's funny is, he's talking about rest, and now he brings up, now strive, work, go after it. And, and, and we can pause here and be like, all right, God, I'm totally confused. You want me to rest, or you want me to strive? Well, here's the picture here. Now, I want to use this, this analogy, and it's a great, what a great quote Warren Wiersbe gives us, because this word here, this, word, this idea of striving is actually, it's called an aorist subjunctive pre, uh, present. What the idea of this is, it's an active word, meaning based upon something that's happened in the past, there is now this condition that you can enjoy it or not. You can grasp it or not, and it is available to you at all times. This past work that's been accomplished, the cross, freedom in Christ, rest in our lives through Jesus Christ, is available, but it's conditioned upon you going after it, you living in it. Let me give you this quote. Warren Wiersbe describes this verse this way. He says, it is by believing that we enter into rest. So we believe we get into the rest by believing, faith. And by obeying God through faith and surrendering to his will that his rest enters us. That's a pretty good quote. Let me, let me repeat that because that's, that's good right there. He said, it is by faith that we get into the rest through Christ. And it is by obedience through our faith and surrender to the will of God that that rest that we have entered now comes in us and becomes part of our life. I now allow that rest to become my normal way of life. I now, and I now understand what it means to pause and reflect. So, so it's, yes, I rest from a completed action. I rest, this is not a gateway to idleness. God isn't saying, hey, just give up life and have fun and be lazy. He's saying, no, we strive to live our lives based upon the rest we have in Jesus Christ. In fact, I would dare say here, rest is absolutely, it's not passive, it is active. It is actually an act of resistance. The culture screams, get busy, get going, get going, accomplish, improve, do more. An act of resistance is, no, I'm going to stop and I'm gonna pause my life. I'm gonna reflect on what Jesus has done for me. I'm gonna reflect, I'm going to strive to understand his rest more and apply it into my life. I'm going to pause my world and let, there is rest for my soul and now it becomes rest for my life. So, so here's the picture. Spiritual rest is what we desperately need. But physical rest will never be accomplished, truly, if we don't understand the full rest that we have spiritually in Christ. Let me, let me show you what he says. He goes on here just for a moment. He says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience, so that we won't be disobedient. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and active. By the way, I find that very interesting do you remember what Jesus' name was? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word is God. He's God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now we have the written Word of God that reflects the Word who became flesh. He says, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He says here, here's the deal. When you reflect your life on the word of God, you find rest. Why? Because now you get back to mirrored what's really happening on the inside. So this takes time. This takes moments where we have to pause and lay our lives up against the word of God, where we allow the word of God to reflect in us what's really going down in our marrow and our bones, 
what's really going on down in our depths. And the word of God then is meant to bring us to safety, to bring us to right living, to bring us to how, what it looks like to truly live for him. In, in fact, by laying my life, uh, the word of God on top of my life, I find what it means to be refreshed and renewed in Christ. So I've got to take that moment. I've got to pause and allow the word of God to go down to my marrow and bones and in the nooks and crannies of my existence and reveal to me who I really am so that I can get it right through forgiveness, come back to the cross and find once again forgiveness for my sins and to be able then to live obediently. Now that doesn't happen automatically. That doesn't happen in a shadow. That happens by intentionally pausing and allowing the word of God to speak and refresh and renew and convict. He says, because in the end, our lives are laid out naked before God anyway. He sees it all. Listen, you, you think, well, I'm, a, I'm trying to live, prepare my life for death. Some of us are, are living to die instead of dying to live. And when we, when we die, we're all gonna leave unfolded laundry. We're gonna leave, leave unchecked items in our to-do list. We're gonna, we're gonna leave unkept appointments our business will not be finished when we die. Staring at your date book. There, that's why there's erasers on pencils. It, any moment, right, depends on our heart beating. He says here, listen, do you not know that all of these things are laid open and bare before the Lord? So make the schedule, yes, and I'm a schedule person. I like to have a schedule. But in the end, I better pause and allow God to reflect in my life. Am I really resting in him? Am I really finding him to be rest? Am I, am I allowing my state of mind to become conscious of eternity or am I wrapped in my time? Wrapped in my calendar, wrapped in my schedule, wrapped in whatever I'm gonna do. Listen, this morning, you're frazzled? You're beat down? You're depleted? And you feel emotionally drained and you feel maybe even issues with your family or finances or relationship? I love what F.B. Myers says in his book, The Christ Life for Your Life. It says there are tens of thousands of Christians who understand the first rest. He's talking about rest in Jesus, eternal salvation through Christ. But have not gotten the second, who have not understood the second. They can look death in the face without wavering, but they cannot look panic, disaster, bereavement, pain, or trial in the face and be still. You know what he says? He says, here's the, the point. Most of us get chapter four, verse one. I need to trust in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for my sins and rose again so that I don't gain heaven by works, I gain it by his work. Amen, we all get that, right? That's salvation. But then it says to strive to enter that rest and very few of us actually live in that truth where we live our lives with a deep, satisfying fulfillment in Jesus. Our minds wander to and fro, we're frazzled beyond measure. We're not experiencing the salvation that we trust. We're not living the life that Christ intended. Like yes, he is our rest, but now I gotta live in it. I've gotta rest in it. I gotta pause my life and let the word of God reflect it. I've gotta let him convict it and move it and stir it. God to allow him to have his way in bringing rest into my life. Listen, you want to know how you're doing in that realm? I believe the physical life is a shadow of how we truly are experiencing spiritual life. I'm not saying there aren't exhausting moments. But if we don't stop and pause and reflect on what God has done, those exhausting moments will take over. They'll take over our minds, they'll take over our attitudes, and they will eventually take over our actions. When I pause, I then begin to reflect on all that God has done. I begin to reflect on his death and resurrection. I begin to reflect on all that he's given me as a life of godliness. I begin to see Jesus more. And when I see Jesus more, oh, I can breathe. I get rest. When I pause and reflect on all that he's done, I can see where he's taken me and what he's doing. I can be still and know that he's God. Mark Buchanan in his book, The Rest of God, says this, powerful. L listen to these words. All things not God 
all things made by God need rest. And maybe especially us. Because unlike goats and beetles and flies and lizards, we try to outwit and outrun our limits. We think we're the exception. The one for whom busyness will translate into fruitfulness. We think because we figured ways to build impossibly tall and loathsome buildings and to dig immensely deep, broad holes so far as to spy on babies in the womb and to tease out strands of DNA, or that we can send whole computer files from New York to Nairobi in a split second. We think because our industry and ingenuity seem boundless, we can also figure a way around our God-imposed need for stillness. We can't. The need is not conjured away by medication, technology, discipline, cleverness, sheer willfulness, because they will always come back to take their due. He says we only find rest in Jesus Christ. Are you at rest this morning? Is your world chaotic? Listen, the storm may be brewing. There's a Savior who says, peace be still. You hear maybe you're being lazy and what you're doing is you're living by fear. Maybe you need to let the word of God be open over your life and, and to sh go down to your bones and your marrow and speak truth, reflect to you what's really in your heart. It's interesting, this past, uh, this past semester, uh, we, we found out that some of the kids and some of the young people in our church were a part of a program down at the, with the Barbara Ingram School of the Arts, they were, did the Wizard of Oz this year. I think it was the 75th anniversary or something. And The Wizard of Oz is one of my favorite movies. I love it, you know? It's such a great movie. And I love the Scarecrow and the, you know, Lion, Tin Man. It's just a great movie, one of my favorites. Well, when, that, when that movie was first made, even today, it stands as really, it stands the test of time. And in many ways, it has been considered one of the greatest movies of all time. The reason for that is multiple. First of all, it has some of the greatest music of any movie. And secondly, it also, the, 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 the animographics and the, the working of lights and, and color were, I mean, they were revolutionary in that day. In fact, if you remember back, some of you might remember back 1939. All right, very few of you probably remember back then. But some of you do, back in 1939. Or some of you may have just been a year old or some really old people that are here like, my mom was born in 38, so that's why I'm saying that as a joke. Um, but if, in 1939, there was this, this moment, and it's been called one of the greatest fermatas. And what a fermata is, is a, it's where a sustained note is held out or where there's a pause in the music. It's called one of the greatest pauses in music in cinemography. And there was this pause. And what happened, if you remember the story, Dorothy's house in Kansas begins to go up in the twister, and during that time, there's this music playing. It goes, da 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 And here comes the, you know, what would be the Wicked Witch of the West comes flying by. Here comes all the, her, her family come flying by. There's cattle flying by. And there's a chaos, a crescendo of chaos in music. It just, boom, bang, tsh, tsh. I mean, listen to it. It's amazing. It just, and people are, I mean, wrong notes all over the place, things out of tune. There's just this sustaining of chaos. And then the house lands. And there is this, what's called a fermata. It's a stoppage of the music for a period of time. And there's a stoppage. And all you hear is Dorothy go, oh my. Then you hear absolute silence. And it's called one of the most dramatic moments in television history. Everything before that is black and white. And you watch Dorothy walk through the rooms of the house. She gets to the front door and looks in a sepia tone. She opens the door. And for the first time in television history, there is color. Black and white is turned to technicolor. And you look out and there is the land of Oz, Munchkin land, the yellow brick road. And then all of a sudden, the pause ends as Dorothy takes a step out into the land of Oz. And all of a sudden, there's this light, airy, beautiful music being played as she stepped into a new world. Now, I want you to consider, I know this is an illustration, but I want you to consider this for a moment. How are we going to live for the better day yet ahead in Christ if we don't stop and pause and consider it today? 
how are we going to live for Christ more and more in a culture that's screaming, get busier, accomplish more, or get out of the way? How are we going to understand the life that Christ has for us if we don't pause and reflect and allow him to open the door of the dream that we have of eternity, the call that we have of of eternal things, where we can see what really our life is about. If we don't ever pause, folks, if we never pause, we're never going to live. Because we're never going to live the way Christ intended us to live. So this morning, we're going to take time, we're going to pause, we're going to reflect on the death and resurrection of Christ. We're going to allow this to search our hearts and remind us what Christ did. Let's stand together as we pray this morning.